Hi, welcome. My name is Alex with Premier Credit Consulting. I am the president and co-owner here, and I'm so fortunate because today we have Taylor Westergaard joining us for our Back to Basics webinar. Taylor, thank you for joining us today. Uh, a little information about Taylor. Taylor is an accredited financial counselor and a certified financial planner. Her company, Evolving Money, helps individuals and families become extraordinary with their personal finances. And she has her bachelor's in personal financial planning and over five years of experience helping people improve their financial lives. So Taylor, again, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to talk about this kind of stuff with you and all well, the people. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're pumped to have you. Um, you know, my first question is a simple one, and it's one of those that uh, I, I hear quite a bit from people when I'm talking to them, but why don't people like budgets? So the question is simple, but I don't think the answer is, and I'm sure you know that too. Um, people don't like budgets for so many different reasons. And so when we talk about money, like our beliefs around money are... Um, our entire like attitude and belief about me is ingrained in us as early as nine years old. And so there's a lot of things that happen generationally, uh, culturally, and just at such an early age that is going to affect how we view money, how we view budgets, how we view handling finances. And so a lot of those things are just deeper than just, you know, I don't like math or <laughs> whatever the other excuses that people have for not wanting to do budgets. And they're all valid excuses, but they're also things that like can be overcome. It's not something that we want to, you know, keep people at. The other thing is that a lot of people don't know what a budget is. Um, so a lot of my clients, when they come to me and they're, you know, I ask them like, have you done budgeting in the past? And they'll be like, yeah, I, I keep track of my expenses. And I'm like, okay, like what expenses? And it's normally just a list of bills. They're reoccurring like rent, utilities, um, subscriptions they have. And that's not a budget because that is your bills. Those are going to come out regardless of what happens. A budget is, is there for the things that are behavior driven, uh, the choices that you're making, the things that are related to your values, uh, your beliefs, the things that matter most to you. That's what a budget is, not your bills. Uh, yeah. And so, yeah, if you leave out groceries, uh, gifts, um, you know, entertainment stuff that you do, hanging out with friends and family, the things that you spend money on there, if you leave that stuff out, that's not a budget and it won't help you very much. And then you hate budgeting and it's really frustrating because it's not working and then everyone's upset. So, <laughs> yeah, well, one thing that I read recently that I really liked, it was in a newsletter from the AFCPE and they said that budgeting is uh, learning how to spend consciously. And I really like that. And I think that's very much in line with what you're talking about is bringing in those other expenses and the behavioral element, not just looking at your bills every month. Yeah, I kind of tell people that budgeting is one of those things that is, if you like personality tests, if you like the MBTI or the red, yellow, if you love all those things, budgeting is the best personality test because you are seeing what you are consciously spending money on, what you value most, where your energy is going, where your time is going. That's like the, in, in a quantitative number, like a number will show you what you value. And so uh, you're, you're right, being conscious of where that stuff is going is going to help you understand like, hey, are you in alignment with the things you value or is there something that's going awry amiss? And it, you'll see that in symptoms of stress, anxiety, overwhelm around budgeting. That might mean you're not spending in alignment with what you truly value. So I know that we've got like a list of questions to go through here, but what you just said is absolutely fantastic. Aligning your values with your actions and using your budget as a way to identify where you're spending your time, what's important to you and what your values are essentially and how that can create anxiety and stress. Can we just take another minute or two and maybe elaborate on that? Because that that's something that doesn't come up when most people think about a budget. No, you're totally right. Because it is one of those things where it's normally people think of numbers, math, uh, things that do cause some stress. But when you are, the money that you spend if you are spending all of your money on, you know, gifts for friends or uh, things in shopping, Amazon, you may be 
you're seeing the symptoms of anxiety from like credit card debt, um, the over overspending, you'll feel guilt that uh, buyer's remorse when you buy something and it's like, oh, I probably didn't need that. I know I'm supposed to be paying off this credit card debt, and but I really, you know, it was cool that I saw this thing on Amazon. You know, you'll feel that buyer's remorse. And when you have that accumulate over time, gosh, it sucks. Like it's not fun to deal with. And so, yes, it's one of those things where you know, you're exactly right. Most people don't talk about this, but you can see what is most important to you, where your, where your money is going is your energy. If people say time is money, well, that's true. Like you have energy, you have very limited resources and time, energy, and money, and you have to pay attention to where those are going. Yeah. How cool. I see. I love that because for a lot of people who have big goals, like buying a home or something along those lines, usually part of the process of trying to achieve that goal is trying to make everything fit within a box. And when that happens, I feel like people get faced with very complicated decisions, uh, when it, whether it's cutting expenses, trying to make more money. And if they don't know why they're doing it, or if they feel like there's additional friction, maybe that's because there's misunderstanding about how they're spending money, what you know their values are versus what they're trying to accomplish that i really like that so you know uh, this is a, a great opportunity to ask for for people who have struggled with budgeting in the past and people who have like you know like you said stressed about the numbers but really haven't gone into the full picture of budgeting um you know what advice would you give them if they haven't had success success in the past but maybe they want to give it another shot well, I think you're like when you're explaining how, you know, if they don't have a clear picture of where they're going or what they need to be doing to achieve the goal of buying a home or getting a new car or having an emergency fund, all those savings goals that you might have going on vacation, like all those things do need to be forefront, but they can also, it's like, well, you may not know exactly how to achieve that just yet. You might have a dollar amount that you know you need. You might have like an amount that you know you need to be saving. You might have that in the back of your head. But if you don't have a clear path to that direction, you know exactly how many months it'll take, how long it will be until you can make that happen. It's really easy to have like a kind of effort mentality of mm -hmm. like, oh, you know what? What's another month? Um, I'll, I'll get to it eventually. I'm not going to hit this goal for years anyway. So why not just buy this thing and I'll worry about it next month. And this like, accumulates over time and then years go by and you're like, oh, we still haven't made any progress. But the other thing is like, you know, you're not being totally realistic. Again, when I come back to like budgeting, you can set goals of like, I need to save X amount to achieve this goal. And then here are my bills. But if you aren't paying attention to the things that you can control, which is your groceries, shopping, the behavior driven activities, um, you will not be able to hit those savings goals. Mm. And if they, if, and then you create, you create a plan. You're like, yes, if I say $200 a month, I'm going to give you know, like $2,400 in the end of the year, and I'm going to buy this thing and it's going to be so cool. And it's like, well, they don't realize that their groceries are three times what they were expecting because they're not tracking it. They're not paying attention to what is actually being spent. Um, and that can be really hard to do, especially if you're trying to do it in, you know, there's, there's flaws in the spreadsheets, budgeting apps, there, there are flaws in these systems. And when you let the technology prevent you from uh, being able to track what you're actually spending your money on, where it's going, how far to get there, uh, it can it can really be detrimental to your progress if you have no way yeah. to track. So so tracking is important, it sounds like, because I, I feel like a lot of people will put together forward-facing budgets. You know, this is what I'm gonna do in the future, but they don't really look backwards to be able to say, okay, what have I done in the past? So you know, I would assume that that's kind of one of the basic things that somebody can do is maybe just take a month, look at what they spent, where they spent it, and use that information to prepare for the future. Um, are there any other basics that you would recommend for somebody who is thinking about, you know, hey, I, I, I've got a big goal. I want to improve my credit. I want to buy a house, and I want to be financially healthy. We know that tracking is one of those basics. Are there any other basics that you would recommend that they look at? Well, I think you definitely hit the nail on the head with like the looking back them, like, you know, I, when I work with my clients, my clients look at the last three months and get an average of what was happening in those three months to, in order to set a grocery budget. And when you, they do, when you do set that grocery budget, when you decide to say like, I'm going to spend X amount on groceries, dining out, shopping, clothes, all this stuff. If it is significantly 
reduced from your three month average, I need you to explain why or what you're going to do. What is the plan? You can't just say, I'm going to spend half as much as I usually do on groceries without thinking, what am I buying then? Am I buying food that fuels me? Am I buying food that's going to be easy that can fit in my schedule and work with the time frame that I have in my busy day? Uh, or if I reduce dining in half, am I going to have to say no to friends? What if I have a lunch every week with my friends? Does that fit in the budget? Are we thinking about that? Most people are just looking at numbers, but we got to look at lifestyle. You got to see like, what do those numbers mean? What, when you set a budget for dining out for a hundred dollars, that could be dining out twice for a family, if not once these days. Right? Not once, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and is that really doable? Can you really do dining out once a month? Um, and that's it. And so being realistic there. The other thing that is the budget killer that people, you know, while we do need to look back on things, we do need to also look at a year. A lot of people think budgets are just for a month, but you've got to set a year long budget first in order to make the budget for the month. And what I mean by that is I, you know, I show a calendar to my clients, January, February, March, always December. And I ask them, what holidays do you spend money on? Whose birthdays are you spending money on? What kind of events are coming up? Do you go camping in summer? Do you get ski passes in the winter? Like, what are these huge, like, when's your car registration coming out? When's Amazon Prime coming out? Uh, do you do back to school shopping? All of those things. If you, once you fill out that whole calendar, you'll realize that there is something every single month that you wouldn't have put in your monthly budget if you were just thinking of a monthly budget. And so those are budget killers. It just destroys it. It's like $200 every month that you didn't plan on. And then again, you just, it's frustrating. Your budget's not working. You hate budgeting and everyone's upset. So you have to look at a year's worth of expenses in order to make that monthly work. See, I, I love that advice simply from the standpoint that I've been in the financial services world for over a decade. Um, and I have made that mistake so many times, especially early on in my career when I had first got married and all this stuff, just looking at one month and think, thinking this is the month, right? And, and you're right. There's always those expenses that come up, whether it's school shopping or holidays or, you know, and it totally throws you off. So um, just to summarize, if I can, you know, obviously look look backwards, right? Look at what you've spent um, and then build a budget, not just for a month, but also look at a, a full year and really try to identify what, what those we called ir irregular expenses, like things that are not consistent every month, but things that come up throughout the year. Is that what you'd call those? Exactly. You know, I say yearly random spending. Some people call it a sinking fund. Um, you oh, save like money it. in order to take it from it um, throughout the year. So it's supposed to be at zero, but you build and it decreases. And so it sinks, right? Sinking yeah. fund, yearly random spending. Yeah. That's what you'd call it. <laughs> I love that. I love that. See that, that alone, I think is just a, a great basic tool that if, any of our clients just take that away, you know, that can really alleviate a lot of financial stress throughout the year, knowing that those uh, expenses that come up for these things that happen annually aren't going to throw you off of reaching your bigger goals. Um, so I love that. That's I, I, fantastic information so far. Now, for a lot of my clients and for a lot of the clients that we work with, um, you know, a, a good portion of them deal with debt. And in my experience, you know, debt comes with a high level of insecurity. Uh, and so when you're working or talking to people who have debt, is there any advice that you give them that can kind of help them feel less secure or I'm sorry, less insecure about their finances? Give them a little bit of confidence. Uh, is there any information that you would provide that can kind of help our clients in that way? Yeah. So when it comes to debt, I mean, debt is a really complicated thing, but at the core of it, debt is, you know, you borrow from your future self, but that debt, if you look at it with a you know, lens of gratitude, like that debt probably got you out of a sticky situation. Maybe it provided while you were out of work, maybe it got some through some medical bills or auto repair, or, you know, maybe it did just provide a increase in lifestyle that you got to enjoy for a short period of time, but it is to the bill is due, but it's not something that is negative. It, you are just borrowing from your future self and your future self just has to pay it back and kind of taking a step back from like the shame, the guilt, the overwhelm from it. Like these are tools that you have used and now you are just 
in the natural cycle of that tool is paying it back. Um, and so as far as like getting debt paid off, one is just, you know, definitely removing some of that guilt, but two, making sure you do have a plan to pay it off. Meaning like you can, there's lots of calculators out there. I have calculators too, that can show you if you pay, make X amount of extra payments a month, this is how far it's going to go. And because if you have that date in mind, it can make it a little bit less overwhelming. Like it's not just like this big giant monster that will never go away, um, especially with student loans. But it is also just like making sure you get, ask, ask questions, ask questions to Alex or me and like, say like, is there something else we can do? And there's so many options for debt. It's like student loans, making sure you're on the right payment plan, balance transfers to get 0% interest, um, debt consolidation. There's like so many options to help relieve some of the stress and like the, the speed, maybe even speed up some of that debt payoff. And so if it's becoming overwhelming, it is time to maybe get some external advice uh, on what you can just, just get some ideas, kind of talk things over to see if there's something else you can do to help alleviate that stress. Yeah, I, I like that because I, I know that in in my personal experience with owning a business, with running into emergencies where I've had to rely on debt, you know, things like that. Um, I, I understand where the insecurity comes from, but like you said, understanding the purpose of the debt and understanding the kind of natural cycle of how debt works and then having that date. I love that because for a lot of people, it feels like it's never going to end. But when you have a plan and when you have a date and, and it's something that you can be motivated by, um, I found that my personal experience and an experience with clients, you know, that's, that's a big victory right there. And another thing you said about shame, right, is you know, kind of alleviating that. And one of the things that helps alleviate that is having a plan. Um, and so I definitely agree with you, you know, getting external help, getting advice, recommendations, or even coaching can really kind of take you to that next level in confidence, alleviate that insecurity. I absolutely love that information. So um, we, you've killed it so far, Taylor. Uh, obviously, I think it's clear to myself and all of our clients, you've got just a, a wealth of knowledge when it comes to personal finances. So my last question for you is one that might be a little bit tricky. Um, I know that financial advice is everywhere, right? If you look up anything to do with finances, you're going to find a million different articles saying pretty much the same thing just in a variety of different ways. So to kind of help our clients uh, cut through the noise, do you have any advice for clients on strategies or practices or even habits that they can focus on that would improve their overall financial health? Well, I think one of the strategies is to not listen to your neighbors uh, when it comes to finance. <laughs> Like I like that. Saying, there's a wealth of knowledge out there, but your neighbors should not be one of them. And the reason why I say that is not because their neighbor's dumb. Your neighbor might be an expert at this, but it's also wealth and finance, wealth itself, like building wealth, being rich is not visual. It is not something you can see. You can see a car out in like a really fancy car out your window at your neighbor's house, but you don't know if they're in debt or the only thing you know is that they're even more in debt or they use savings to get it. Or they're like, they have, you know, a hundred thousand dollars less in savings. That's the only thing you know about their financial situation. Um, and so when you take a step away from like looking at what everyone else does, I think the it's with social media, with everything else that's going on, take a step back from all that, you know, a lot of good garbage that you're going to get, like <laughs> from people who do want to just make money off of some strategy that they're going to sell you. Um, and then I would say just educate yourself as best as possible, whether that is hiring a coach or getting a book. Um, I would recommend a couple books for you. One is like, I will teach you to be rich by Rumi Sethi is one of my favorites as far as basics go for finance starting there or, um, your money or your life by Vicki Robbins. I think that those are great, you know, getting some good, reliable sources of, in, uh, for people to trust rather than the wealth of, you know, social media, Google, focus on one per one section that you want to focus on and go with that, go with that person, go with that book, go with that strategy. Um, and, and, you know, of course, making sure you're doing your research to make sure it's the right one for you. But I think just trying to siphon through that noise. I like that a lot. And, and one of the things that you said that has helped a lot with our clients and with myself personally is really focusing on something specific and not trying to take all of it in. Um, you know, I know that, you know, when we're working with clients on establishing healthy credit habits, you know, they have big goals, they have credit score targets, they have all of these different things, but we're just focusing on, on one thing, which is let's get in the habit of doing this one thing really well. 
Um, and so I totally agree with you on, on narrowing your focus, finding quality information or finding a quality coach um, and keeping it simple. I, I love that because it, it's over. I get overwhelmed with the amount of information that's out there. You know, I have to do a lot of research for different things in my business. And sometimes I'm like, man, this is just this is chaos with how much information there is. So, uh, Taylor, thank you so much for investing your time and helping our clients better understand the basics of financial health. Uh, tell me, do you have any other tips or recommendations for our clients before we wrap up today? You know, I think I think my only la I mean, last tip is like a budgeting app is where most people start with when they start with budgeting. And the budgeting app is a tool to implement a budget. It's not there to create a budget. It's not there to show you how to do a budget. Um, it is just a device where you take an existing budget that you've created and implement that budget. And so if you don't have a good budget, the tool is not going to work. And so stop using, stop trying all the apps until, you know, budgeting magically works for you. Uh, you need to focus on the foundations of what a budget is like, you know, going through this webinar, um, getting more information from Alex's resources that he offers, talking to me about creating a budget. Like those are things that you need to do before the app. So just don't get distracted by the apps. That's, that's my final tip is like... <laughs> <laughs> Man, I wish I had that information like 10 years ago because I signed up for all of them and was hoping for some type of magic wand. And it's just not that way. You nailed it. Uh, so great, great tip. Great recommendation um, for our clients. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to reach out to us. We would love to assist you with that. Um, and you can find uh, Taylor with Evolving Money. Taylor, do you want to give them uh, your information, uh, website, contact info? Yeah. So the website is uh, evolvingmoneycoaching.com. Uh, the Instagram is at evolving money. And so I am active on Instagram and Facebook. And so I'd love to have you reach out. You can book a call with me, a few, few free Q&A call with me on my website as well. You can get my contact info at evolvingmoneycoaching.com. Awesome. Well, Taylor, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Alex. I really appreciate this chat with you. Hey, appreciate it. And everybody out there, I hope you have a wonderful day. And thank you so much for your trust in our services. We hope this was a value add for you and we're here to help you reach your goals. So feel free to reach out with any questions. Thanks, Taylor. Thank you.